and, and really, I mean, I'm just bringing him on to us to actually handle our election for us so we can do, because he has to leave in 10 minutes, so, um, because it's Jacob's birthday. <laughs> Yay, happy birthday, Jacob. <laughs> happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Jacob. Happy birthday to you. Yay, our little superhero. Jacob, what do you say? How old is he? Five. Jacob, what do you say? He said, <laughs> he's our superhero. So um, you would just say a couple things and I'll give you the name. Of the sure, okay. Uh, we're working on manners, so that was an exercise in, in <laughs> saying thank you. Uh, as much as he's grateful to people saying happy birthday, he's much more interested in the Super Friends video. He's watching on my iPhone, which is why he likes coming to work with me, because he gets to do that. Uh, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, sorry I can't stay with you longer, but I have his entire preschool coming over to our living room, uh, and I have to make a fort out of cushions and stuff like that. I uh, just wanted to, uh, Kara put me on the spot and wants me to help do the election stuff, but I just wanted to say thank you. I, I know that the turnout today is a little lower because of the rain. Uh, that's understandable, but the turnout that I'm really interested in isn't so much the turnout in today's rain. I'm interested in the turnout that you all helped create in November. I saw so many of you at the United Headquarters uh, near UCLA. Uh, I saw so many of you on the phones. I saw so many of you getting off those button, those buses and coming in for what was left of the stale pizza uh, and, and accomplishing so much. It took a while because it was so damn close in a lot of those races for us to realize how big that blue wave was, but your work swung those districts and that's making the difference now and can i just say holy shit nancy pelosi <laughs> wow <laughs> my favorite newspaper cover uh, that i've seen in a long time uh, i look at it frequently online is the the new york daily news and the day after nancy kicked his butt it was a photo of a sort of a downcast trump with the headline caveman <laughs> which I thought was phenomenal. So, on to other elections. Kara, what the hell am I doing? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> These elections are not as closely contested as some of the swing districts. Okay. <laughs> so, um, since we have no uh, contested candidates because everyone is so excited to be and happy to be on our amazing board, uh, we are going to be asking for a vote of acclamation. But first, uh, before I turn over my duties to Mike, here's the list of who's running. We would like the people running to come up for just a second, say hello, say why you're running, and uh, for maybe a minute or 30 seconds, just so the club knows who you are. Okay? Sure. Uh, okay. Uh, Kara Robin for president. <laughs> Okay, so I'm, I'm running for president yet again because I love all of you. I have the most amazing board. We have so many great things planned for next for this year and really proud of all we accomplished last year, if I have a few minutes to tell you about it. So I humbly ask once again for your vote for me for president. Thank you. For vice president, Ellen Bridal. Where's, where's Ellen? Okay. Uh, Speaking for Ellen Bridal, <laughs> Ellen, you probably all know if you were at headquarters or if you've done any any uh, voter calling um, for candidates or taken a bus anywhere because Ellen is our elections victory starts today chair. She's amazing and she really gets the job done. She really is the maven. She's a legend in Arizona. I mean, she really deserves to uh, have your vote for political vice president. I'm very excited to have her on board. Ellen. Vice President Operations, Ingrid. Hi, everybody. Um, please give me a vote because nobody else is going to do this job. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, um, 
I, I don't just do operations and put events on. I also work very closely with Ellen on getting people elected. I was on the buses. I was at the headquarters. Uh, I'm a passionate Democrat, and uh, all I want to do is kick the Republicans' asses, okay? So uh, give me your vote. Thank you. <laughs> Vice President of Communications, Sukun Lan. Well, last time I was in such uh, event was uh, when uh, 13, 20, 12, 13 years ago. Uh, so same old people, Kerry, Mark, <laughs> and Kelly, uh, they are as young as uh, it was that time. So I become older. Uh, but I hope to, to help the club to uh, get the communications, the website. We have Facebook, we have Twitter, then uh, things have changed then uh, we use all the tools to elect the people we, th that can represent us. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Treasurer Susan Blanchard. I don't really have anything to say other than Put it up to your mouth. give us money. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really have anything to say. So I'm just, I've been the treasurer for the last few years and I guess I'll be it again. <laughs> <laughs> Secretary, Mr. Kelly Willis. I do the the write-ups and and by uh, the uh, what we do at the board meetings every every month uh, the minutes. I'm sorry, my brain is hurt. And and I also do the the recordings right now. There, I'm recording me. This is very strange. Um, so all this is visible on YouTube within a couple of days, so that we're all above board. So if you've got friends who couldn't come out in the rain, you got friends who were out of town, stuff like that. They want to finally see the faces behind the you know the scene and everything tell them to go check us up on youtube and sakun's got links for it it's really it's so good to have sakun up here doing calm thank you very much thank you and the e-board members at large michelle morton mark salzberg and connie thomas speaking to the slate no connie connie sir connie connie Okay, so uh, I'm Mark Salzberg, Connie's coming up, and I'm going to pass the microphone to her, because she never talks. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. I am so glad to be here. And thank you all for coming out. I am a uh, member at large for the e-board, and we're asking for their vote. Yeah. I... <laughs> I need your vote. I have um, been on the um, e-board for the past year, and it has been an awesome experience. The team is so great, Kyra, everybody. Uh, I've been able to work on so many projects and reaching out into the community, and just uh, you know, seeing and talking with new people, Democrats, and some Republicans. But um, I'm want to uh, let you all know that all the things that we, we're doing are good things. We're working to turn California blue, to turn the nation blue. And the only way we can do it is we continue to do what we do and we reach out to others to get them on board, to understand what we're doing and why we're doing it, and to get them to work with us because there is so much that needs to be done. We, we are, you know, it's serious, and I don't want to uh, preach to the choir. But I'm asking your vote. It is necessary. Uh, my prayers are that uh, we are all together, and I know God is hearing our prayers, and he is working with us, but you have to vote because that's something God can't do for us. We have to do it for ourselves <laughs> because if he could... <laughs> 
Okay. Well, what I was going to say, if, if, if God can make all the difference, we would not have the president we have now. So it's up to you. You make the difference. Does that mean there is no God? No, no, no. there is God, always. <laughs> Thank you, Connie. Okay, so all I wanted to say is we've got some more elections to win, right? Yes. Right? Right? We took seven seats in California. We've got to take a few more, and we've got to win all the ones that we won last time. So that's up there. Second, we've got to take the Senate. Okay, no more, no more Kavanaugh's, please. Okay, and of course, the insurance against Kavanaugh's, we've got to take the presidency. Okay, so we're all up for that? Okay, this year, we're going to start campaigning for the Senate, believe it or not. We're going to start now. Yes. This year, we're going to be campaigning for the Virginia State House. We're going to be starting in a few months. And governor. And, and governor. governor. Well, we'll see what the happens there. Anyway, we all need you to step up again, help us make phone calls, help us get out there and win and kick some Republican butt. Yes. That, that's quoting someone, I think, Ingrid. I want to make a statement. I'm on the board, but for some reason I don't have to be voted for it. Um, but I just want to thank Mike Bonin. I'm just so impressed by all you, your efforts for the homeless, oh, especially, but other things too. But the way you the homeless thank you. Thank you. All right, well, that was worth running a few minutes late then. <laughs> uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, so is there uh, a motion to uh, approve all of the candidates? Second. Okay. Uh, it's been moved and seconded. Uh, all in favor, raise your purple lavender cards. Okay. Uh, all opposed? <laughs> all right. It is unanimous. Congratulations, everybody. <laughs> Jacob. Jacob. Come on. We're going to go. Party time. Thank you so much, Council Member Bonin, yes. our hero. Thank you. Well, welcome. And also, there are uh, some other elections that just went on in the last uh, this month. And uh, we have quite a few club members who were elected as Assembly District Delegates to the California Democratic Party. That means they will be helping frame the platform. They w they, I could say we, because I'm actually on the executive board of the California Democratic Party. Uh, and we vote to endorse candidates. And we really, we do uh, much of the direction of the party is because of our involvement. So please, if you are elected, stand up, say your district and your name. Mark Salzberg, 62. Yes, yes, our Mark Salzberg, our past president and member at large. And vice president. Hi, Anastasia Foster, AD50, Santa Monica Rent Control Board. Yes, yes. And let me tell you, that Santa Monica slate, I mean, they really <laughs> kicked ass. As did 62nd Unanimous. And here's our executive board. Hi, Tom Camarello of the 54th AD, and we won 13 out of the 14 on our slate, progressive slate, and I'm the e-board person again. Thank you. And, and well, a proud member of this club also. Yes, a longtime member of this club, past president of the Culver City Democratic Club. Also, I want to mention 62nd AD, 14 out of the 14 were elected. Right. And uh, my name is Taylor Baisley. I was one of those 14 with Mark at uh, out of uh, AD 62. All right, all right. So we're going to make some changes. <laughs> all right. All right. <laughs> and anyone else? Mm, nope. Oh, that's really good. I'm really proud of all of you, really. Thank you. Actually, a lot of other members of the club who do generally come out, not in the rain, uh, were also elected. So um, I was going to say some of the things Mark did, so that's great. So one of the things we really did, our club did, was make a huge impact. 
at, at the West, uh, West Side Democratic Headquarters. You know, we were one of the founding sponsors. Uh, there were six Dem clubs, uh, two action groups. And we, we went out in the phone bank. Thursday was West LA Dem Club Day. So we would go out in the afternoon. Ellen would do all this research and all. And we would be calling out of state Senate seats mainly because our headquarters was all about flipping the house. Did we flip the house? Yeah. 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 Did we flip seven seats that were the seven targeted seats? I mean, really, really. It was just, it was amazing. But you know, I went to a meeting a couple of weeks ago that Karen Bass had. And uh, it was to sort of recap what we did, what we did well, where we could improve, and what's going on in the future. And Julia Bramley, y'all remember Julia? She used to be an assemblywoman in our district. And, and um, anyway, Julia, she's a, a congresswoman. And she was giving a wonderful talk, and she said something that resonated with everyone, which is our seats, our new congresspeople, they don't really have these seats. They're renting these seats. They're just tenants for two years, OK? We need to get them a longer lease, right? <laughs> really, it's up to us. We can't take anything for granted. Because you know, I mean, Katie Hill, they've, she's already got someone declaring. They all have these opponents ready, chomping at the bit to take that seat back. Because some of them were really slim margins. Mark, Mark uh, said a little bit about that, but we're going to be needing to go out and protect the seat that our club, I think, single-handedly won. Who, what seat is that? Mary? Marianne? Joan? T.J. Cox! <laughs> T.J. Cox in District 21, of course, because uh, Ingrid made it happen, too. Because I was there the day before leading a bus. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of us were on that bus. A lot of us were on that bus, knocking at doors with dogs. And uh, that was a hard, that was a hard district to work on. But, uh, <laughs> but we took it. But, but what? Like the slimmest margin. These were nail biters. You know, we also, uh, we also had people going out. Mark went out to Arizona, to Nevada, campaigning for Senate. Did we win? Thank you, Mark. Mark took Arizona and Nevada for us. So we're really <laughs> excited about that. We also took every seat, as you know, in, in um, our state uh, constitutional officers. A couple of them were really iffy, but we prevailed. One of the reasons, I think, is because we gave this amazing fundraiser for Tony Thurman, who won for Superintendent of Public e Instruction. Um, I organized like five other Dem clubs. Um, Pat, knew, Pat helped a lot. New Frontier was on board, Santa Monica, uh, Beach Cities, um, Westchester Playa. I can't even remember. But we, we got a whole coalition of Dem clubs on board committing $1,000 to Tony Thurman. All these other people came. We raised a ton of money for Tony. So of course, that's why he won. So thank you all for coming out to the Landon House, as usual. Um, anyway, I have like these whole things to say. I wanted to tell you all about last year. But you know what I think I'll do instead? I'll write it up and send it out in the e-letter. Unless, do you want to finish your juice, or do you want to come on right now? Whatever you want to do, Miss Hall. Holly's the best. I just have to tell you, I am so thrilled that Holly Mitchell is here with us. I mean, she is. <laughs> Poor Holly. <laughs> I mean, first we say, oh my gosh, it's raining. Nobody's coming out. What are we going to do? Um, do you mind if we postpone this? And then all of a sudden, all you guys come pouring in. So they call. You love this club. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I, I, first met, I first met Holly when I went to, I used to attend the 47 Assembly District Club. And Holly came and she was running for Assembly. And I had never met her before. And you were chair, was it Crystal Stairs, yeah? And executive director of Crystal Stairs. I had never met her. And I, in fact, I was really good friends with her opponent. So, you know, I wasn't in there exactly, I mean, I was, me. I'm like, I listen, I'm unbiased, I'm not even a Libra, I always try to do both sides. But I listened to Holly Mitchell and I thought, 
Oh my gosh, this woman is ready to hit the ground running. I mean, she was so impressive. So impressive. You know, you ask her a question, she knew, pa she knew past, present, and future on this present on this question, which is really, really important, you know. So that was already, I'm like, oh, thank goodness I don't live in that district. I don't have to vote against my friend. And then to this new person, right? So then the next time I had an, sort of an interaction with Holly was a bill that she was presenting, a, very bill, a bill that's very important to me. You don't remember this probably, that she was a little anxious to present because, you know, you, as a legislator, you really don't want to bring a bill up that's not going to pass because it's really important to have bills passed. We talked about this. The bill was the fracking bill, <laughs> the anti-fracking bill. And she was really strong. She wrote a fabulous bill, <laughs> fabulous bill. I was part of this little coalition that went down to AD 66 to try and convince Al Suchi to vote for Holly's bill because he really didn't know. They don't know unless we're out there on the ground in their offices. Legislators might only hear from one side like the oil company, right? So what they did to Holly's bill was really horrible. I mean, <laughs> called gut in a man. Uh, how about just totally gutted her bill? It was really sad. But she was there with us, there, anti-fracking. You know, we'll, it'll happen. We'll get it done like Medicare for All, it will happen. Then the next thing she did, remember that fabulous meeting we had in Culver City? Prop 13, John Chung, Holly Mitchell. Oh, that was such a great meeting. Um, what was his name? Great, the guy from, the, the, who had that great postcard showing Disneyland with the magic castle and then the little house and they pay the same in property taxes. Remember that? So that was just, that was really great. So, and, and of course, Holly, again, past, present, and future, knowing everything. So I'm so excited to have her here with us. To uh, She's chair now, uh, was it the budget and fiscal, fiscal the budget committee of the, uh, of, of the California State Legislature, the Senate, the Senate Budget Committee. So she's exactly the person to walk us through this. Um, this is really exciting. It's going to be interactive. We get to see what they do. You know, I mean, what do you do? Where do you give the money? H how do you allocate the money? How do they make these awful choices? You know, and some of us will say, why did you vote that way? We don't like the way you voted. You know, we, we, we think the money should be spent elsewhere. Well, you know what? When your choices are really hard, you see what they're doing. So that's why we're here, to see, to hear from Holly and to see how we spend our money. Thank you for this. This made me feel so civilized. <laughs> it reminded me of my grandmother. I have her punch bowl with these. I'm going to pull that out when I get home because this just made me so happy. You know, it's the little things in life. So I'm glad to see you all are here. When I pass by the Mar Vista um, um, Community Center, the kids are out there playing a full game of lacrosse. So the least we could do is be inside talking about the future of our state, right? It's great to be here. Um, yeah, I did get the call that said, it's canceled, nobody's here. I said, okay. I pulled my rain boots off, then I got the call. They're here. I put my rain boots back on. <laughs> and I said, here we go. But Thank you. Prepared. you see that? I said, prepared, that's right. Every girl's supposed to have a pair of pink rain boots. Come on now. <laughs> Even in Los Angeles, when it never rains, I'm so happy to get to wear them. So good morning. It's great to see everybody. I was so busy singing happy birthday to Bonin's little boy, I realized I didn't lock my car and I left my purse in it. So she's going out to lock my car. Sorry. I was singing happy birthday. Silly me. So when I decided, I don't know how many of you have ever heard me tell this story. So when I got mad and decided to run for office, it was because I was sitting in a budget subcommittee that was supposed to be chaired by Merv Dimely. I was running Crystal Stairs. Assemblymember Cam Lager Dove and I had organized three busloads, I think, thank you, of moms and dads and their kids had to rent car seats to go on these buses to drive to Sacramento. 
to go up there to talk about the proposed cuts to subsidized child care. That year, 2008, the legislature cut a billion dollars out of subsidized child care. And we were going up there to, to bring the people whose lives would be impacted. I had written letters to the managers of Ralph's supermarket to ask that he let a couple of his checkers off. We had worked for weeks to come up with budgets. We'd made little budgets to show their income, their child care costs, and what they'd be left with at the end of the month to really try to bring home why child care keeps California working and why, from my perspective and our collective perspective, cutting that kind of money out of subsidized child care was not in the best interest of California. So we go up there, these bus loads, we go, I go to Donnelly's office and say, we're here, I brought these LA County moms and I was told, oh, he's not chair of the subcommittee anymore. I'm like, what? Well, why? You know, I've been staff in the building many years, so his staff and I had worked together, so he kind of whispered, well, because he's running for Senate, he stepped down from the budget subcommittee. Sometime too much information is not a good thing, because <laughs> then I got really pissed. And I got pissed because there was not another LA County member appointed to replace him. And if you've ever watched the budget process, you know, my budget committee as a whole, we've now grown so large, we can't even all fit on the dais in the largest hearing room in the Capitol. But the subcommittees are, are tiny. It's five members. Three members from the majority party, two from the minority party. So it's that, a group of five, making the decision, doing the deep dive on the work, they make the recommendation to the full committee. So I had five legislators, no one from LA County, who were gonna make a decision impacting one-third of the state's children. L.A. County has one-third of the entire state's children. And no one there with an L.A. County life experience, lens, anything. Mad as a cat on a hot tin roof. <laughs> and sat there through that process and said, you know, I think I've got the professional experience, the practical experience of running a large government subsidy program serving um, California's most fragile, maybe I should run. And that's really when I made the decision to run. And it was in the budget committee that I got mad made that decision. So when I won, I asked for budget committee and I've served on subcommittees and three years ago now, former pro tem Kevin DeLeon appointed me chair, second woman in state's history to chair the budget committee. Thank you. That's important from my perspective because the budget is where the action is. You know that we introduce 4,000 bills per legislative session. Two calendar years, 4,000 bills. I, I'm with you. I've shaken my head too. Like, are there really that many new ideas left in the world? I, <laughs> I doubt it. <laughs> and the assembly lifted their bill limit so they can introduce as many as they want and it's gonna be chaotic. So, but the budget is where the allocations are made. The budget from my perspective reflects the values of all of us as Californians. It really does. If you look, if you old like me and you still keep a, check reg a checkbook and a check registry, <laughs> if I were to look through your check registry, it would give me a glimpse into who you are and what's important to you. If I see tithing, if I see donations to your church, if I see donations to Democratic candidates, if I see donations to your Democratic club, if I, you know, it gives us a glimpse into what's important to you, right? Our state budget is no different. We are the fifth largest economy in the world. The budget we passed last year was $200 billion. And so, yes, when I was first elected in 2010, um, the media famously overheard me having a conversation when I said, you know, this is a broke-ass state. <laughs> and they ran with that for several years. And that was our broke period. And thanks to the legislature, thanks to Governor Brown, thanks to both of us, but Go Governor Brown, thanks to all of you as voters. Think about the ballot initiatives we've asked you to vote on. Um, Brown, when he was first elected, said he was going to take it to the voters, and he did. 
and you made the additional half cent sales tax permanent. So thanks to all of us collectively, we are in a healthier place in terms of the state's economy. And so Governor Newsom walked into a very different house <laughs> than Brown did eight years ago. Very different. And so to see his budget um, presentation and I thought back to eight years ago when I came in with Brown when we were still cutting. When Brown was elected, we had a $30 billion deficit. Wow. Newsom walked into the fattest savings account in state's history. And that took hard work on all of our collective parts to be disciplined, to prioritize saving. And yet, I will always be the voice in the room, and Jerry Brown will verify, to say, Mr. Governor, I appreciate your focus and your desire to save for a rainy day, but sir, there are parts of the state where it rains every day. It's raining every day. And so we also have a responsibility to invest in California and Californians. You know, we're never more so reminded about infrastructure than a day like today in L.A. and how many puddles that I <laughs> speed through to get here to you. <laughs> so, you know, infrastructure is the first thing we put on the back burner at home. Nobody wakes up and says, I think I just want to put a new roof on the house today just because. Nobody does that. And so delayed maintenance and all of these state facilities coming off of a 10, 15 year recession, we have state prisons, state schools, state office buildings that are in dire need of more than a facelift, major structural, because we have ignored maintenance. So we have work to do. We have to invest in California and Californians. So there's this amazing tool that I used at a budget town hall a number of years ago. Carr and I had a conversation at the governor's swearing in. She said, oh, I want to do this budget thing. I said, oh, you should call, I can't remember the name, Next 10. Uh, and they have got this wonderful kind of process, blah, blah, blah. Well, they're so popular now, you have to book them apparently months and months and months and months in advance to get the clicker and have them walk through. And also, they're not ready yet with the 2019 budget. Just came out, we're working through it. So we're going to do two things. I'm just going to share a couple things with you in terms of the current budget. I want to tell you about resources where you can go find budget information. And then I'm going to deputize all of you as members of the California legislature. <laughs> How about that? You decide if you want to be a member of the upper house or the lower house. <laughs> you decide, however you find yourself. You want to be in the assembly of the Senate? You just name yourself. But we're going to collectively be the Joint Legislative Budget Committee. So we're the Assembly and the Senate together, and we're going to go through this process. But let me just share with you. So you know the, you know the process generally. Governor introduces the budget um, by the 10th of January. It is his budget. He then hands it over to the legislature, and it becomes our document. And we have a bicameral house. And so the budget is actually in the form of a budget bill, whether it's an A, B, or S, B. We go back and forth every year. I think this year there it's going to be an A, B, if I remember correctly. And the budget committees um, begin the process, a parallel track process. I gaveled down, had our first budget hearing last week or so. Department of Finance comes to present the budget to us. Members ask questions. The ledge analyst gives the legislature their um, research-based, analytical, nonpartisan perspective on what's been proposed, and we go through the process. Full budget committee will have probably four kind of overarching hearings over the next month to talk about um, some of the kind of biggest, brightest, shiniest new objects in his budget. We'll talk about his health proposal. Um, we gaveled down ye Thursday on wildfires and had Office of Emergency Services and CAL FIRE present. And just as Angelinos, you know, we have to recognize that this, as Brown said, is our new abnormal. These are some of the few facts I was reminded about in that hearing. 
We have a 147 million dead trees statewide. 147 million dead trees. That's both on federal forestry land and state land. In 2018 alone, not counting the fires in 2017, 23,000 structures have been destroyed. Debris removal, post-fire, post-mudslide in 2018 alone, one million tons. I ask him to repeat it because I can't wrap my head around a million tons of anything. Debris removal. The governor declared 16 states of emergency. The president declared three major disaster declarations. And we have one million acres of burned land. So as we talk about the budget process and we go through all the things that are typical in the budget process every year, K through 12, K through 14, child care, community colleges, UCCSU, health services, then we have this, which has become our new abnormal. And so the point of the hearing Thursday was these resources can't wait for the budget to be signed by June 15th, or for us to pass the budget by June 15th, the governor had signed it, and we start the fiscal, new fiscal year, July 1. These are resources that need to hit the streets like yesterday. So the point of last week's budget hearing was to augment our current budget, which is reflected in Next 10 stuff, because we have to be able to make sure that the funds are available to manage this. And then it's the delicate balance. A number of my colleagues in the Budget Committee asked the question about, well, what portion of that is a private landowner's responsibility versus the state? Insurance committee, insurance companies are showing up. You, we all remember after the earthquakes when you couldn't get a policy written all over California. And so we're on the cusp of like trying to make sure that the entire industry doesn't flee. And then there's PG&E. So this is one area of funding where you have to recognize all of the different factors that have to inform the kind of decision we make. If PG&E, well, not if, they've, claimed, they've declared bankruptcy, what does that mean for all of us to have a major utility declare bankruptcy? So these are all of the balls that are in the air that directly or indirectly impact, remember, the budget is our what? Our value statement. And so how do we bring all that to bear? None of us in this room may have been affected by these fires, but we'll be touched by it. It is a major <laughs> statewide occurrence of a magnitude that we have never seen before. A million acres of burned land and I haven't talked about the human toll, toll. I haven't even talked to you about the lives lost, uh, the, the livelihoods lost. Imagine you live in a town that has been completely devastated. So not only have you lost your home, you've lost your place of work. Your children have lost their school. Uh, you know, Paradise, I talked to com Insurance Commissioner Lara uh, we went to dinner the, uh, the other night. He had just come from a tour, and that's all we could talk about for the first hour. Um, to hear and understand that as far as your eye can see, devastation, just, except trees. And I said, well, how are the trees still standing, Ricardo? He said the fire traveled through the electrical lines underground. And so you have these trees with a full canopy, but they've been burned from the inside. So, there's, so they're burned out from the trunk with a full canopy still standing. So when we talk about debris removal, those trees have to be removed. In addition to the other 147 million dead trees across the state of California. Snags are good habitat. <laughs> and Paradise is trying to figure out how to rebuild their community. So we have to balance all of those perspectives.
We have to f figure out a balance. So, welcome to my world of the state budget. Two tools I want to introduce you to. I have an amazing team uh, who are the Senate Budget Committee um, staff. A brilliant young man um, who I had the pleasure of hiring as the staff director, I guess two years ago now. Joe Steppenshaw is the director. Um, and a team of very dynamic, engaged, um, committed young policy analysts. So minutes after the governor releases his budget, it's a fury. Assembly budget staff, Senate budget staff, the LAO all go about their business of writing summaries. So if you don't want to have to read the entire governor's budget, these summaries are great cliff notes, quite frankly, because they put, they put it all in context. In many instances, they give you perspective of either current funding levels, any major actions we took in past years. So they put the action he's proposing in a broader context. So I think it's helpful. You can go online to the Senate, California State Senate Budget Committee, and get a copy of the summary of governor's proposed 1920 budget. Secondly, the Ledge Analyst Office does the same thing. They get busy, they produce an overview. The Ledge Analyst has a website where you can download their summary as well. The LAO, the Ledge Analyst Office. Mm -hmm. LAO, Ledge Analyst Office. And so you can get their summary. Those again are the proposals based on his January release. You know the process. He releases the budget in January. That's based on a guess because all of us haven't paid our income taxes by April 15th. So it's again based on a guess in terms of proposed uh, uh, at a guesstimate of state income. He will then release what's called a May revise, which is an update to the January budget proposal around May 10th. That takes into account all the checks we've all written to your wonderful state of California. So it, they have a clearer picture of state income. And so some adjustments are made to what we anticipate the state's bank account to look like. So we have subcommittee hearings. All of my budget subcommittees, there are five of them, health, education, uh, public safety, the courts, uh, general state government, and another one that I'm missing. Everything in the budget fits into these subcommittees, and they do the deep, vibe, deep dive. Department heads come testify. Members of the public in impacted groups, key stakeholders come and provide testimony. Thumbs up, thumbs down the proposal. If you tweaked it like this, it would be better, whatever the case may be. All that information rolls up into the full budget committee. Then we get the May revise, and we sort of start the process all over again, depending upon how drastically different the May revise is from January. Now, Jerry Brown used to make my life difficult. <laughs> because in January, he would have a budget, and then the Women's Caucus would have to go beat down his door because it wouldn't have anything on early care and education. There would just be major missing pieces. And we would fight, 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 fight from January to May, and then May revise, we would get a little something. Well, this is going to be interesting because this budget has everything in it, from my perspective, including the kitchen sink. So I'm not sure what our May Revise experience will be like with this governor. There will be some adjustments. Um, both houses, the Assembly and the Senate, will make some adjustments and will raise some issues um, that aren't in this budget. I'll forecast a couple for you. Not a lot in this budget on seniors. We have heard, and I right? we have received heard testimony um, from seniors. You know, SSI, SSP hasn't had a COLA, a cost of living adjustment in years, and we eliminated all those COLAs. We had a big meeting in my district office yesterday, folks representing the DD community, the developmentally disabled community. And while we, for example, have increased um, minimum wage, the reimbursements for those who care for the developmentally disabled are so low that they are nowhere near meeting the new increase in minimum wage. So the problem is in the facilities where many of our fellow Californians are living or at home with people who come in to provide care, 
they can't afford to stay in that profession because the reimbursement is so low, they can leave and get a job to pay them more. So th some of those things are missing. As great as the budget is, trust me, I was doing the happy dance during his press conference because so many of the issues I have worked on eight years now, I was like, whew, a governor who gets it and a healthier economy so we can afford these investments. But there are still some areas that we as the legislature are going to have to make a priority and bring to his attention. You'll hear about more of those as we go throughout the course of the year. So it's raining. Everybody has stuff they have to do. We're going to go through kind of a modification of this exercise. Again, this is on last year's budget. Just so you can have a sense of all of the factors you have to consider, remember, members of the legis members of the Assembly and the Senate, in terms of making your decision around budget priorities. So here, K through 12 education, Prop 98 sets a minimum level of spending for education. It generally, generally requires that 50% of new general fund revenues go towards funding education. However, if this requirement is suspended by the legislature, a share of new revenues do not have to be used for schools. There have been a few times when we've done that because our back was against the wall and we had to keep the lights on in other areas of the budget. And yet everybody in, here in the room knows what we hear. You know, back in the heyday, California was spending for education was, you know, number one, number two in the nation, and now we're number 40 whatever. And when people say that, I say two words back to you. Prop 13. Now, in some, in some rooms, that does not make Holly a popular girl. But whether you like me or not, be clear, I'm going to bring the truth. And it, and it seems the older I get, the less I care about that popularity. That's, you know, being over 50, people have said that, right, yeah, but it's about whether I care about whether you like me or not. That's a, you know, be, be turning fit 50 is like magic. Like, I woke up, I'm 50, I don't care. <laughs> I'm being silly with you all today. So I'll read these for the folks in the back of the room who can't see it. So, so you're having to make your decision. This tells you the surplus that we had in the budget last year, $10.2 billion. So the point of this exercise is you don't just get to spend willy-nilly. You have to decide and make your priorities and levels of investment. And every investment, every time you click on, I'm going to spend all the money in education, then this comes to zero. But you haven't hit the other areas of your budget, right? That's the balancing act. People come in to me, you just don't understand. You have to make this a priority. You know, we need you to be our champion. I appreciate that. And what about C, D, E, F, G, H, I? And don't forget what we opened with about the fire and that loss and the area. So that's all the stuff you have to keep track of, right? So just from your own perspective, status quo, spend $67.9 billion from all funding sources on K-12 through as mandated under Prop 98, an increase of 3.3% from the previous level of spending. That would put total K-12 through per pupil spending about 11% above the projected national average. That sounds wonderful. No budget change. Spend $2.9 billion of Prop 98 funding to finish funding the local control funding formula two years ahead of schedule. Hmm. Another one. Spend $100 million in one-time Prop 98 funding through the Commission on Teacher Credentialing to recruit and train special education teachers in an effort to reverse a critical shortage. Another no budget change. Combine the two no budget change options to both fully fund LCFF and spend $100 million to recruit and train special ed teachers. So that's a C option, A and B. Here's another one that you're going to increase your spending. So these first two no budget change, you're just going to take the existing money and reprioritize it. So you are taking from Peter to pay Paul. Be clear. It's no budget change in the dollar amount but you are reprioritizing how it's spent. Now, these last two in the red are actual budget changes. 
spend 7.1 billion don't forget this over here spend 7.1 billion to increase K through 12 education spending over the 17-18 fiscal year by 10 percent or about 7.1 billion more than proposed in the budget putting per pupil spending about 20 percent above the projected national average remember our other option was you put it up at above 11 percent here's another option spend 20 billion Inca increase K through 12 education funding by about 20 billion more, putting per pupil spending with the top 25 percent of states in terms of projected per pupil spending. Just make your mental note in terms of how you would manage that. And I'm going to encourage you. This is a public website. Um, maybe you should stay in contact, Carl, with with Next 10 so you'll know when they upload the 2019 budget and then either you all or just at home you can click through this and figure out how you would do it and then the next time you'll see me you'll say no wonder you look so tired and you have gray hair <laughs> you'll understand let's go to uh health care hannah two more down we will when we're done we'll give it to you absolutely all right here's health care so remember what you decided before and deduct your spending from your surplus. You can't, in a check registry, you have to deduct what you spent. Status quo, do not make additional reductions or increases in the Medi-Cal program, which will be 21 billion in 1819, up from 20.1 billion in 1718. That's status quo. Here are your spending options. Spend $250 million to extend Medi-Cal to a portion of uninsured and low-income undocumented youth ages 19 to 25. We ultimately did that last year. Here's another option. Spend $225 million to provide a refundable tax credit to enrollees in the individual market with income levels between 400 and 600 percent of the federal poverty level. Spend $300 million to provide enhanced premium, assi enhanced premium, uh, premium assistance to low-income individuals and families with income levels between 200 and 400 percent of the federal poverty level, people who are enrolled in Covered California, which is California's, California's version of Obamacare. Establish a refundable tax credit and subsidies to make premiums more affordable and expand coverage for undocumented youth ages 19 to 25. And then here's the one on the bottom that my friend over here with the beautiful silver hair is going to love. Establish a single payer system of health care in California where a single entity such as a government run organization would collect all health care fees and payments and would pay for all health care costs proposed in SB 562 introduced in 17. Estimated would cost $400 billion to implement. Now, folks have argued whether or not that $400 billion estimate was accurate or fair. I sit on health committee. I voted for SB 562. And then I lectured them. Because ask my 18-year-old, I'm good for that. And I said, I'm voting for it today in the policy committee, but you haven't given us any financials. And I sit on the budget committee. And so you have a responsibility to work through that process. And frankly, what they gave us, I didn't find particularly helpful. I have to be very honest with you. And it's difficult as the LAO, because the legislature pushes them, because, you know, we want certainty. Okay, tell me, if I spend this now, what will I save? Give me the exact dollar amount, and when can I see it on the books that I've saved it? And in this, it's hard to say. And so it's going to be a leap of faith for all of us, if that's the direction we go, to institute this kind of program and figure out how and where and how quickly we can capture savings. But you're clear that we're going to have to capture some savings. <laughs> and we're going to have to not spend in other areas in order to finance that kind of move.
We are. So I think that's enough. You all have a headache. Now you're welcome to my world. <laughs> but that's the process when we have these budget hearings, the subcommittee hearings. That's the process we're going through. It is a constant, where can we invest? How do we develop priorities that are in the best interest of the entire, very diverse state of California? And how do we pay for it? How do we pay for it? Questions or comments you have of me? Yes, ma'am, in the back. That's right. <laughs> and, I, and, you know, I tell people all the time, I was not a voting age in 78, but I certainly remember I have clear, it's kind of bizarre, memories of my parents debating and talking about it. And then I remember the teachers in school, if that passes, all the things we weren't going to be able to do at school, and it's come home to roost. And I don't believe those who were of voting age, who engaged in, those, in that dialogue, thought that they were saving Disneyland versus Grandma's house. I don't. Holly Mitchell. Okay, <laughs> For a split role. So let me tell you how that happened. That was a Hancock and Mitchell bill. And we were asked by the coalition who ultimately got split role, and, they, and you don't call, you're not supposed to call it split role because they've done focus groups, and I forgot what you're supposed to call it, but we all know it as split role. Make it, yeah, we'll make it fair was our kind of right, make it fair. So the coalition came to us because they wanted to do what didn't happen here. They wanted to be able to not just guess about numbers that it would be able to put back into counties for local spending. They wanted hard numbers. So the way to get that was to introduce a bill that would, be, be, that would be referred to committee that would have a fiscal analysis. So Lonnie and I were very clear that we couldn't get that through the legislature at that time. But getting it heard in rev and tax, an analysis would be written. It would empower the coalition. They'd have some financials. Well, Lonnie and I couldn't even get it set in rev and tax committee. We had a chair of Reverend Tax Committee who lectured Lonnie and I about all of the years he'd spent on tax reform, and he didn't want to have the bill heard. So we did what we do and went around that chair to leadership <laughs> and said, look, we just want our bill heard. You know, to not allow a bill to be heard is just not appropriate. So the bill was heard, an analysis was written, so we were able to get the fiscal piece that we were able to give to the proponents who have done, who have, you know, I, ballot initiatives make me very nervous because that's ballot box budgeting. And you see it as a complex, multifaceted process that an initiative that says, do you want the world to be better, ain't going to cut the mustard. And so I tend to ask Ryan, when they walk up to me at Target, they get a lecture. I sign nothing, no. But this process that this coalition has gone through has been impressive in terms of all of the pre-work they did prior to settling on language and actually getting it qualified for the ballot. And then they made the strategic decision to wait to the 2020 ballot because they wanted to increase the likelihood of success. So that was the point of the bill. It didn't move. Hancock termed out, Skinner came in, Skinner and I um, agreed to do another piece of it if we thought a legislative fix would help. And all, the le all our bill was going to do was be to put it on the ballot, and it's already qualified. Now, welcome to my world. Jim Caucus had our retreat last week, and we had a fascinating economist come to talk to us, and he said, that's great if you're going to mess with sp split roll, but it won't be enough money. He says the only way to do right by public education funding is to be rid of Prop 13 as a whole. You know that's the political third rail. And so I looked at my colleagues around the room and everybody was like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I'm going to pretend I didn't even hear what he said. 
But it has just made me think all the effort and time and all the political capital we will use to get that ballot initiative passed 